Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here to give you another video to help you improve your chess game. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about principles today. A principle is a heuristic, it's a guideline, it's a little saying that tells you how to do something or how to do something better. It's different than a goal. A goal is what you're something you're trying to accomplish. For instance, the free, three goals of the opening could be said to be activate all your pieces safely, efficiently, and effectively. Two, get some control of the center. And three, find some place for your king to be safe in the middle game, for instance, to castle early and often, so to speak. So, so the three goals of the opening are those. But what are the principles in the opening? Well, there's lots of principles in the opening like knights before bishops and get the pieces out on the king, the side you're going to castle first and uh, move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. These are all principles, not goals. Okay, so one of the things I get asked is what's the difference between a principle and a rule? Well, in chess, there's two types of rules. One type is the rules of the game, like, you know, how a king moves or how a knight moves or how you castle or, you know, how a, how a pawn can capture or what happens if somebody uh, goes over on time. Those are rules. But then there's rules of things that happen on a chessboard, which are pretty much absolutes. And if they're not absolutes, then they tell you something that maybe only has a very few number of exceptions. So let's, let's start with the rule before we look at principles. So here we have the opposition rule. If you have a non-rook pawn, and you have your king immediately in front of your pawn, and the opposing king is an odd number of squares away. In this case, there's one in between the two kings. If, it, if, he's, if there's one square in between, I shouldn't even talk about the distant opposition. If there's one square in between and we have the local opposition, then whosoever move it is does not have the opposition, and they don't get what they want. So white wants to win the game. If it's his move, black has the opposition, and if no matter how well white plays, if black plays correctly here, if it's white's move, then it's a draw. If it's black's move, black has to give way, and if white has the opposition, and white can win, and therefore the opposition becomes a rule in this position. Now, are there any exceptions to the opposition? Well, yes, there's the tic-tac-toe rule, which has no, no exceptions, but it is an exception to the tic-tac-toe rule. So if you have your king one in front of the pawn and it's a non-rook pawn, but your king is now on the sixth rank and he's one in front of the pawn, now if it's white's move, it's not a draw anymore. So in all the other cases where the pawn, where the king was not on the sixth rank, it was a draw and here it's not. So this is an exception to the opposition rule. This I call the tic-tac-toe rule. For instance, you play king to e6, black plays king to e8, d6, king to d8, d7, king c7, king e7, white wins. So here, the fact that white has the move, it doesn't matter that black has the opposition anymore. It's a tic-tac-toe win. Does that mean the opposition is not a rule? Well, it's a rule, but it has this one glaring exception, which, as I said, I call the tic-tac-toe. And if you're not familiar with this, I have a video with king and pawn against king. I think it's a two-part video where you can go back and we go into this in detail. All right, so what's a principle? Well, a principle is a little bit like a rule. It sounds a little like a rule, except that there's so many exceptions that you can't really name them all, but it's true a great majority of the time. So therefore it becomes a principle instead. So we talked about one, ones earlier. For instance, we talked about knights before bishops as being a principle. All right, so e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, should we bring out the other knight or should we get the pieces out on the side we want to castle? We have two principles here, knights before bishops and get the pieces out on the side you want to castle. Well, usually when you do knights before bishops, it's not knight, knight, bishop, bishop. It's very often knight, bishop, knight, bishop. So knights before bishops is a good principle, but there's lots of exceptions. There's lots of openings where you don't bring out a knight and a bishop and then you castle and then the other knight and the other bishop. So it's a principle, knights before bishops. All right, now be, I don't want to go into all kinds of principles. We have other videos where I talk about principles. What I want to talk about principles today is with one aspect, and that is 
strong principles versus weak principles and important principles versus not important principles. So when I was teaching principles, one of the things that I ran into was people didn't really understand which principles did they pretty much have to follow almost like it's a rule. And also they didn't understand which principles that they couldn't just kind of ignore because bad things would happen. So I tried to come up with an idea that would cover this in, in multiple dimensions. So I created the dimension of how often a principle applies. And of course, if a principle applies all the time, it's no longer a principle, it now becomes a rule. But suppose a principle applies not quite enough to be a rule. It, it has a lot of exceptions, but not as much as, you know, some weaker principles. Then I call those principles strong principles. Principles that, uh, that happen, you know, when you should follow them almost all the time. There's not a lot of exceptions, but there's enough that it's not a rule. For instance, Andy Soltis wrote a book. Uh, well, he's written several books. One of the books is called The Wisest Things Ever Said About Chess. And it's a book basically full of principles. And he also has a, some books out on other things like uh, sec uh, Grandmaster Secrets of the Opening. And I think in the Grandmaster Secrets of the Opening book, he says the one principle of the opening that has the fewest exceptions is develop your rook to the same file that your opponent has developed his queen, even if there's temporarily pawns in the way. He says, as far as he knows, that's the principle in the opening that has the fewest exceptions. Okay, so I took exactly what Andy said and I gave it a name. I said, that's a strong principle. In fact, by Andy's words, Andy would say, that would be the strongest principle in the opening. Does that make it the most important or the best or anything like that? No, no, no. It just means that when you have a chance to apply that principle, it's probably going to work. It's not a rule, but it has the, the less, least chance of having exceptions. So that principle becomes a strong principle. On the other hand, a principle that has so many exceptions that it's almost not a principle might be something that's considered a very weak principle. Uh, it's, it's a little harder to come up with examples of that because weak principles often aren't even principles at all. For instance, when people say, don't bring out your queen too early, as far as I'm concerned, that's not even really a principle because too early doesn't mean anything. If you have, for instance, after f3, e5, g4, what should black do? Well, queen h4 is checkmates. That's a fool's mate. He's not bringing out the queen too early. So... I consider that not to really be a principle at all because too early doesn't mean anything. But what I do say is that that would be at least a very, very weak principle. On the other hand, if, you, if I said to you, don't bring out pieces where they can easily be, att be attacked by pawns, well, that's a little different. Suppose white plays e4 and black plays e5 and white plays knight c3 and black plays queen h4. Well, that doesn't even threaten anything, and white's going to simply win a tempo by developing the knight and hitting the queen, and now the queen is, quote, too early. But what, what's really happening here is you're allowing your piece to be attacked by something that's less, and then you're just going to lose time. The, the reason why people use queens in this sense is because everything on the board is worth less than a queen except for the other queen, which means any time it's attacked, it pretty much has to move and lose time. But, the, but that principle that I came up with which has nothing to do with the queen, it has to do with just lower, allowing lower pieces to unnecessarily attack your piece, could be used with any piece. For instance, suppose someone plays a Pierce defense and white plays bishop to b5 check. Well, this is the same problem that the queen had when it went to h4. Black can simply play c6, which is an awl, attack with less, and now the bishop has to move away, and moving the pawn here was perfectly good for black. So a much better principle than don't bring out the queen too early is don't bring out pieces to squares where they can easily be attacked by lesser pieces and those lesser pieces get to better squares while your piece has to re kind of retreat or go to a lesser square. That principle makes a lot more sense and has fewer exceptions. So that's a stronger principle than don't bring out your queen too early because it, it has less exceptions when you state it that way. Okay, so we've got strong principles we've got weak principles. Okay, well, so I needed another dimension. I needed a dimension that had to do with whether you should follow something or not. 
it's very possible you could have a principle that's not that strong, it's not that weak, but it's very important. So what's an important principle? Well, I came up with two aspects to important principle. One is that it, that it happens so often that you need to follow it a lot because if it comes up, you know, 10 times every game and you're not following it, you have a potential to make a lot of mistakes as opposed to a principle that comes up once every 50 games. Well, if you don't follow it as much when it's one every 50 games, it doesn't hurt you as much as a principle that comes up 10 times in a game. The other kind of aspect of an important principle is it's a principle that if you don't follow it, it could cost you the whole game. In other words, it's, for instance, I, if I come up with a time management principle that says, if you can recognize critical moves, critical moves are ones where you want to think long and hard. For instance, right now I'm reading, I have in front of me this book, Chess Rules of Thumb by Lev Albert, and they have Chess rule of thumb number 135, by the way, rule of thumb is the same thing as a principle. They say recognize five characteristics of a principle of a critical position. And then principle number 136 is a critical position is one about which you should think long and hard. Okay, well, principle number 136 about thinking long and hard, that's a really, really, really important principle. If you don't rec if you can recognize a critical position let's say a complicated one where the whole game is riding on it and you have time on your clock and you just play one fast move and don't try to figure it out, that, that's really, really bad thing to do. That's disastrous. So not following that principle is disastrous. Is that also a strong principle? Yes, it is a strong principle. Could, you, could we consider it a rule, a rule that you should, in a critical position is wanting about you should think long and hard? Well, I guess there's some exceptions. For instance, suppose it's critical to decide, you know, whether you should trade queens or not, but it's a really easy decision. It's really critical that you don't trade queens, but it's also easy to see that you shouldn't and, and what you should do about it. Well, you, maybe you don't have to think long and hard about that move. It's, very, it, it's a very critical idea that you can't trade queens in that position, but it may, you may not have to think long and hard. The kind of positions where you want to think long and hard when they're critical is ones where you're not sure what to do. Like if you're not sure what side to castle on, that could be very critical. Maybe you can't take all day because there's not a lot to go on. You have to use your judgment there. But certainly complicated positions. When you get to complicated positions, you want to think long and hard. Probably the most important opening principle <clears throat> is the one we mentioned earlier. Move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. Okay, so let's talk about that principle a little bit. Um, generally, if you're developing, let's just move Black's Knight back and forth and develop White's pieces. If you want to follow classical development, and I have an earlier uh, video on classical development versus hypermodern, you know, you're, what you're doing is you're moving every piece once. There's the knights before the other bishop. We get the other bishop out somewhere. Then we develop the queen. Then we bring, let's say, a rook to the center and the other rook to the center. This is the kind of thing you're looking to do in the opening. Move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. So let's, let, what do we mean by a tactic? We mean anything that you could do to either win material or prevent from losing material. Because if you lose material, then you're losing to a tactic to the opponent. So let's, let's do something obvious here. e4, knight f6, e5. What should black do? Well... You could say this is not a tactic, e takes f6, because it's just a threat that can be easily be met, and a threat that's easily met is not a tactic. But suppose black blunders and doesn't move the knight. Well, let's say he plays c6. <clears throat> now white has a tactic. He can win material by force, he can trade a pawn for a knight, and get the equivalent of you know, a piece ahead for a pawn. So in that case, if black doesn't move the knight, then white has a tactic. The tactic I call this, and I've written a lot about this and I've done some videos, is I call this a counting tactic because I can make a trade on the f6 square and get a knight for a pawn and I come out ahead. So if black plays a move like c6, he's giving white a tactic. It's a trivial tactic, sure. It's a counting tactic on one square where you're just trading something less for something more. It's an easy counting tactic, but it's still a tactic.
So black can't allow white to play that tactic. So when it's black's turn, if he stops the knight from taking the pawn, this is definitely not a tactic. What's happening is white's just making a threat and black's meeting the threat. The problem is if black doesn't meet the threat, then white has a tactic. So therefore, moving the knight again does not violate the principle. Now that may seem like a nit, and you might think, well, that's just kind of semantics, but it's, it's, it's necessary from the definition to, to make the principle work. So when black plays knight to d5, he's not violating the principle. He's not moving a piece twice unless there's a tactic because there is a tactic if he doesn't move the knight. So it's important to understand it that way. So let's take a look at, let's say, the main lines of the Sicilian. E, e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4. Okay, so there's a principle involved here. I'll get back to that in a second. And let's say black plays c takes d4. Well, you might say that white has to take with the queen to follow the principle because if he takes with the knight, he's moving it twice. But in a sense, yes, you could call this a mild exception to move every piece twice if you take with the knight. But you could also say, gee, but if I don't take that pawn at all, let's say I play bishop e2 and he guards the pawn, well, I'm, I'm losing a pawn then, so I need to take the pawn back or else I'm, a recapture is sort of a de facto tactic because if you don't recapture, you're down material. So you could make a weak argument that taking with a, with a knight is not violating the principle of moving a piece twice. And again, it's just semantics. Obviously, knight takes d4 is not only a book move, it's also the main move. Which brings up an interesting point. If you know that knight takes d4 is a book move, then principles don't apply. I talked about this earlier in my principles video, but in case you haven't seen that, it's worth reiterating that when you have a book move and you know what to do and you do it, you're not violating any tactics. You know, when you're, when you're making book moves, you're moving out of knowledge. Principles are to help you figure out what to do when you don't know what to do. If you do know what to do, if, if you know something's a book move, then there's no principle that applies. Similarly, let's say you an analyze and you have only one move that wins the game and all the other moves don't win the game. Then it doesn't matter what principles you're breaking. If your analysis shows that your move is the best move and you could prove it, as I like to say, if you could get in front of a room full of grandmasters and say, I defy any one of you to show me a move that's better than my move, if you can do that and analyze to that level where you know your move is the best move, then it doesn't matter whether it breaks principles. It's only when you're not sure what to do that the principles are your guideline. So that's very important. All right, let's, let's talk about another principle that's involved here. There's a principle that I haven't seen a lot, but it's a pretty strong principle. And that is, if you have a side pawn and you could take a center pawn and the opponent cannot take back with a pawn, then it's probably correct to do so. So in this case, if white plays d4, black has the opportunity to play c takes d4 and trade a side pawn for a center pawn. Since white cannot take back with a pawn, it's almost always correct here to play pawn takes for black. All right, let's change the position a little bit. Let's say white had played the c3 Sicilian and black had played the kind of solid but passive reply d6. And now white plays d4. Can we apply that same principle? Well, the answer is no. The principle says if you have a side pawn that can take a center pawn and your opponent can't take back with a pawn, then it's almost always correct to do so. Well, here if you take with a side pawn, he can take back. And not only that, he's taking back with another side pawn, bringing it to the middle. So there's really no principle here that would tell black that he has to take that pawn. You know, black could, could play a different move here instead. Let's say you could take with a center pawn instead. Let's look at the scotch like e4, e5, uh, knight f3, knight c6, d4. Well, the best move in the scotch here, because white's threatening to take that pawn, is for black to take the pawn. Is that following the principle that I just gave? And the answer is no, because the e5 pawn is not a side pawn. It's a central pawn. So the principle doesn't say if you could take a central pawn with a central pawn and he can't take back with a pawn, you should do so. 
we could make such a principle, but it would be a much, much weaker principle than the one that says take with a side pawn. On the other hand, just because the principle doesn't say that it's a side pawn taking a center pawn, we can't therefore use logic to conclude that if it's a center pawn, we shouldn't do it. Just because we don't have a principle as much for the center pawn as we had for the side pawn doesn't mean it's not good to take with a center pawn. We don't have any, we just don't have any information about this. We have to come to an independent conclusion aside from taking with the, with the side pawn. And in this case, the independent conclusion tells us the best way to save that pawn on e5 is to take this pawn. So as I said, we have kind of a very much weaker principle here. If you want to make this into a principle, I wouldn't. But if you want to say, if someone has a center pawn and attacks one of your center pawns, and you can take back and you can't take back with a pawn, you probably should do so. And by the way, all these principles always have that caveat, unless there's a tactic. Because principles are just guidelines, and if things allow tactics that are not in your favor, then you just can't do them. So you're not gonna be able to do that. So, so if you have uh, center pawns, and they can be taken by the F pawn or the C pawn, and you can't capture back with a pawn, that's a relatively strong principle. Is it an important principle? Uh, I'd say it's moderately important. It's not as important as certainly as move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic is a really, really strong principle. Some principles that people learn are not even really principles at all. For instance, people tell me, you know, oh, you shouldn't push up the pawns on, in front of your castle king. Well, that's not it. That's not much of a principle at all. If that's a principle, it's an extremely weak principle. As far as I'm concerned, there's no principle there at all. You know, there's many positions where you have to push up the pawns in front of your king. There's many positions where pushing up the pawns in front of your king is really good. There's some positions where it's terrible and abysmal, but there's so many exceptions that making that into a principle, you shouldn't push the pawns in front of your king. This causes me a little problem because one of the first books I recommend to all my lower rated students, when I say lower rated, I mean pretty much below, you know, 16 or 1700, is to read the book Logical Chess Move by Move by Irving Chernev. And in that book, Irving Chernev is really, really, really big on don't push the pawns in front of your king. And, you know, when John Nunn was converting that book to algebraic notation, he noticed that Chernev was, was going overboard with this, and he wanted to correct it. But it was a classic work, and he didn't want to, you know, kind of ruin the work by putting in notes like that. But he, 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 he knew it was, it was not correct. He actually wrote an article about this. So, you know, when you see things like that, I tell my students, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, read Chernev, but then read the other authors too, and you'll see that he goes a little overboard on that one thing. The rest of the book is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's the only book at that level. Logical Chess Move by Move is the only book that really goes into these really basic ideas and principles behind every single move as if you don't know anything at all, as if you just, the only other book you ever read was a book on how the pieces move, and now you pick up a book like Logical Chess Move by Move. It's, it's, it's a really, really good book to start with for game books, but it does have some of these weaknesses, and one of them is that principle about not pushing the pawns in front of the king. So we can see that there's, there's often discussions about these principles, they, they kind of get developed, they get, you know, talked about. Um, in his book, uh, Move First, Think Later, um, I have it over here. It's by um, Willie Hendricks. Uh, Willie Hendricks has a chapter called, If Your Opponent Pushes G4, Counter with G5. And he shows a whole bunch of examples where after G4, black should play G5. And then he says, are you convinced? And he says, well, you shouldn't be because I just made this up. And, you know, I found a couple examples to try to convince you, but actually there is no such thing. And in general, if somebody plays G4, playing G5, even if it's possible, may not make any sense at all. He says, but you have to be careful about people, you know, throwing principles at you that, you know, may or may not be helpful. And he also talks about the principle, an attack on the flank is met by a counterattack in the center. And he says, okay, well, that may be true a lot of times, but he's, he kind of argues, he doesn't use the word weak principle because, you know, when he wrote the book, he hadn't read my novice nook on strong, strong versus important principles. But he basically said, that's a, that's a fairly weak principle. 
An attack on the flank is met by a counterattack in the center. Why is it weak? Well, sometimes an attack on the flank is met by a counterattack in the center, but sometimes the counterattack in the center is impossible. So if your opponent's attacking you on the flank and you think you have to counterattack in the center and you can't, you might think there's nothing you can do. Sometimes an attack on a flank is best met by a counterattack on the other flank. For instance, suppose the two sides castle opposite sides. And then who, you have to throw the kitchen sink at the opponent's king, and whoever gets there first usually wins. All right, well, that's a principle that you have to throw the kitchen sink at people, but it also means that the attack on the flank where your king is is sometimes best met by a, a faster counterattack on the opposite flank if you're cast at opposite sides. So that's a clear exception to an attack on the flank is best met by a counterattack in the center. Now, is it possible that you could cast on opposite sides and you could counterattack in the center instead? Sure, of course. All these things are possible. But he what Hendricks is just trying to say is, okay, sometimes when you attack on the flank, you can defend on that flank. Um, you know, saying, you, saying is best met by a counterattack in the center, best is going to be fairly, a fairly weak way of saying it because there's a lot of things you could do otherwise or maybe the attack in the center is not even there. If it is there and you can do it and it works, great. And if you have multiple ways of doing it, maybe that one is the best one, but you just have to be careful about paying too much attention. You saw earlier, I did a video uh, last week or the week before on the pointing rule, and I showed how the pointing rule is, they call it the rule, but it's really more like a principle, but it's a pretty strong principle, that's why they call it a rule. And, you know, it's on that gray area. But I also explained how people misunderstand the rule, and they misapply the rule, and then bad things happen. And that's always a problem, because even if you have a principle that's important, if you have a principle that's strong, but you misunderstand it or you misapply it, then bad things can still happen. All right, so today we've talked about what's a strong principle. A strong principle is a principle that has very few exceptions, but not so few that we could call it a rule. An important principle is a principle that comes up all the time, like move every piece once before you move any piece twice, unless there's a tactic for the opening. And a Another important principle would be a principle that if you don't follow it, it could be disastrous. Like when you see a critical, complicated move and you have time on your clock, take your time. That's a really important, that's a really important principle and it's also a very uh, strong principle too. Okay, so hopefully today we talked a little bit about the difference between rules and principles. We talked about strong principles. We talked about important principles. As I said, there's books on these things like Chess Rules of Thumb by Albert and Lawrence. There's uh, The Wisest Things Ever Said About Chess by Andy Soldis. All these things on principles. But if you read a lot of annotated game books, as always, good authors, especially instructive anthologies, they're going to be throwing lots of principles at you. In some of my books, when I give a principle, like in my book, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, whenever I give a principle, I give it in italics so you kind of know that it's over and above my annotation to the game. It's really something that's generally true. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed today's video. If you haven't uh, told your friends about the channel, please do that. If you liked the video, hit the like, and we have the subscribe button too. See you next time. Bye.